Good morning, Cross family. Welcome to Church Online. We're so glad that you're able to join us today. As we prepare for worship, do us a favor. Go onto all your social platforms and share this stream and let all your friends and your family know that you are hanging out with us today at Cross Church. Don't forget that directly after the service, you are invited to our Cross Family Meetup. It's just a simple time for us to do community and hear each other's voice. All you have to do is click the link in the description or the comments. We cannot wait to see you there. You and your family are a big deal to us here at Cross. So take a moment, gather everyone around the TV, the iPad, the computer, whatever you have, but let's prepare our hearts for worship because we believe that God can move even in your home. Well, good morning, Cross family. Hey, we're so glad that you are with us today. Man, we've celebrated Easter. Jesus is alive. And so let's come alive today. Let's worship him with everything that we got today. Come on, let's worship together. Here we go. When I think about your goodness, my heart is overcome. I could never stop seeing it. For everything you've done Cause you keep on loving me And you cause my heart to sing And you, you make me come alive again And you, you make me come alive again
your goodness, God. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, you are worthy of our worship. You're worthy of our praise. God, even in this season right now, we can trust you, God. God, when there's uncertainty, when there's brokenness, God, we can put our trust in you because you are good. You're so good to us, Jesus. Right now we worship you because you're good. We worship you because you're faithful. We worship you because you are here for us. You are alive. So we honor you with our worship right now. Worship, Jesus. We worship you, Father.
incredible time of worship. God truly is the way maker. He is even making a way in this time and in this season. So take a quick moment and comment below what miracle you are believing God for. If this is your first time joining us online today, we just want to say thank you. You are a big deal to us. So take a moment and comment I'm new in the comments below. This is our way of getting to know you just a little bit better. And again, thank you so much for joining us today. Here at Cross, we believe in irrational generosity. So as we continue in the worship of the regular giving of our tithes and the offering, we understand that some of you have never given online before, but we want to encourage you that it is safe, that it is simple, and that it is secure. And all you have to do is go to crossatlanta.com slash give, or you can also give at our Cross Church app. Your giving is making a huge difference here in this community. This week, we were able to provide over a thousand meals for the nurses and doctors at Northside Forsyth Hospital. We were also able to provide care packages to help workers disinfect before they go home to their families. Thank you for your continued generosity. Pastor Josh has a powerful message for us today. So let's grab our Bibles, grab our notes, and if there is something that impacts you during the message, feel free to leave a comment and let us know. So let's dive in 
to what God has for us today. Hey friends, Josh here. We are so glad to have you with us online. If you're new, wow, what a big deal. Thanks so much for hanging out with us this weekend. You know, last week was Easter and it was incredible. We shared about a veil found in the Old Testament tabernacle that was ripped so that we could have access right into God's presence. We talked about how that was a symbolic thing that was broken, a wall that was shattered because Jesus Christ died on a cross so that we no longer were separated from the love of God. It's incredible news that we find in Easter. And I really wanted to end this current series that we've been in for about the last six weeks called Dwell on Easter. I thought it would be a great time for it to end. I mean, it's Easter, right? It's the crescendo. It's the high point. It's the big point. We end it all on the incredible weekend of Easter. But in truth, it didn't quite work out that way. Because I started to think about it and I started to think, is Easter really the high point of Christianity? I mean, think about it for a second. I mean, it is the game-changing moment. It is the central point of Christianity. If there's no Easter, if there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, then really this whole thing is mute. It doesn't make any sense. But I want you to understand that when Jesus said, it is finished, God was just getting started. He was just getting started. You see, when the veil in the tabernacle was ripped from top to bottom, when that wall that separated you and me from God's presence was broken, God's spirit moved out. He left the tabernacle so that he might dwell with you and I. See, our sin that separated us from God's love was dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ so that God's spirit could dwell with you and with me. The resurrection proved that God lives. The Holy Spirit proves that God desires to live with us. You know, can I ask you just a simple personal question? In what area do you need God to dwell, to live with you right now? Maybe it's in the area of your finances, everything going on with furloughs and jobs. You need God to dwell with you in the area of your finances. Or maybe you really need God to be with you when it comes to your family. Maybe it's a high stress season with all this isolation. Where do you need God to dwell with you right now? Can you share that in the comments? I know it's a personal question, but, but I think your answer will give hope to us. Hope to everyone watching and listening that, that God wants to dwell and meet us in the places where we feel a little bit cut off, a little bit isolated. Share those in the comments if you don't mind. You see... I think this resurrection, that the whole resurrection proved that we can't keep God in a tomb. This whole resurrection and this whole season has proved to us that we can't keep God in the church, but rather that God is on the move, that his spirit wants to dwell with us in our homes, in our lives, in a more personal way. Very specifically, that God wants to dwell in you. Each piece of furniture that we've studied over the last six weeks or so in the Old Testament tabernacle shows us, revealed to us, a picture of Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Last week, as I discussed the veil, the curtain that separates the most holy place from the rest of the tabernacle, I talked about how it was ripped from top to bottom on Easter and, and how it shows us that there is one more piece of furniture in the Holy of Holies. And, and that's the place we're going to today. We're moving past the veil into the Holy of Holies to see this one last piece of furniture. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, now just really quickly, when I say Ark of the Covenant, how many of you right now are thinking of Indiana Jones? I personally am, maybe you are as well too. And so I'm thinking of Raiders of the Lost Ark. I thought it was an incredible movie, pretty awesome. Now here's my question for you. 
for all the Indiana Jones fans out there, and I'm sure we've got some old school movie watchers that know exactly what I'm talking. If you have not seen any of the Indiana Jones movies, you need to go back, you need to watch them right after this service. I'm just saying that, except for the newest one, maybe don't watch that one. But I wanna know in the comments right now, what is your favorite Indiana Jones movie? Is it Raiders of the Lost Ark? Is it the Temple of Doom? Uh, you know, is it uh, The Last Crusade? Or even if you are the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, you're maybe one of the new people to the Indiana Jones saga, and you haven't watched the other ones, you might want to write that one down. But go ahead and share those in the comments for me right now. I think that'll be a little bit fun. But in the movie, The Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones discovers the Ark of the Covenant and they open up the ark, and the Spirit of God comes out and melts off everyone's faces, turns them all to wax. Now, that isn't theologically correct. So when you think of the Ark of the Covenant, I do not want you thinking about that. That is not the real image that the Bible gives us. But God's Spirit does rest on the ark. And so as we get our theology correct, I want us to understand what the Ark of the Covenant really looked like and what it means to us today. Exodus 25, actually in the Bible, not the movies, describes the scene, and I'd love to read it to you from the New Living Version. It says this, Exodus 25, verse 10, Have the people make an ark of acacia wood, a sacred chest 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it inside and outside with pure gold, and run a molding of gold all around it. Cast four rings and attach them to its four feet, two rings on each side. Make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. Insert the poles into the rings at the sides of the ark so that you might carry it. These carrying poles must stay inside the rings. Never remove them. When the ark is finished, being built, place inside of it stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give to you. He's talking about the Ten Commandments here. Then make the ark's cover the place of atonement from pure gold. It must be 45 inches long and 27 inches wide. Then make two cherubim, two angels, from hammered gold and place them on the two ends of the atonement cover. Mold the cherubim on each end of the atonement cover, making it all into one piece of solid gold. The cherubim will face each other and look down on the atonement cover. With their wings spread above it, they will protect it. Place inside the ark the stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant which I will give to you. Then put the atonement cover on top of the ark. I will meet with you there and will talk to you from above the atonement cover between the gold cherubim that hover over the ark of the covenant. From there, I will give to you my commands for the people of Israel. Wow, that's a pretty intense passage and a little bit different from the Indiana Jones saga that many of us are familiar with. The scripture says that this Ark of the Covenant would have two cherubims, two angels that would cover the cover of the Ark. And in between, these two angels were known as the mercy seat. This atonement cover, the space in between the two angels was known as the mercy seat. We find this in other places of scripture and in the New Testament specifically. Now the mercy seat was where the priest was to place the blood of a pure sacrifice on one day of the year, the day of atonement, where a sacrifice was to be given to appease God for all the sins of of the people. We've broken down why that was important in other uh, messages the last few weeks. Now, the mercy seat. What a name. The blood was placed on the mercy seat. It was the place where mercy sat. See, when God sits on his throne, he sits in a place of mercy. He sits in a place of grace. This makes me think of a verse found in Hebrews 4, 16. I want to read it to you. It says this, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Man, we're living in a time of need, aren't we? 
We need God's grace and we need his mercy like never before. Grace and mercy. These are two characteristics of God's throne. Grace literally means gift. So grace is God giving us the gift of salvation that we don't deserve. It's a gift of salvation that we don't deserve. That's grace. Mercy, though, means holding back something we do deserve. So God is holding back judgment. He's holding back wrath or punishment that we do deserve. See, we didn't deserve God's gift of salvation, but it's available to all of us who call upon the name of the Lord with faith, saying, God, I want to put my trust in you. It's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. But we did deserve God's wrath and punishment because of our sin, because of our bad days, because of our mistakes and our flaws. But God desires to give us mercy instead. Man, that feels good, doesn't it? That God desires to give you mercy and grace. See, God sits on a seat of mercy. His throne is established with mercy and with grace. Wow. Now, these gifts of grace and mercy are so huge for me. I bet they're pretty big for you too. Can you tell me right now in the comments, which one resonates more for you during this season? Is it the grace of God or do you need more of the mercy of God right now? What resonates? What connects with you a little bit more? And maybe even share why that grace or that mercy is so important to you right now in a brief sentence or phrase. You see, inside the ark, there was actually three things. When you'd open up that atonement cover, when you'd flip up that mercy seat, inside the ark were three things. One, the law, the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses, the golden pot of manna, and Aaron's staff. Now, let me summarize why each of these three things matter very briefly. I could do a whole nother message, and actually, I wrote a whole nother message just on these three things, but I'm just going to summarize them instead. God is showing us, first of all, that mercy covers the law. Mercy covers God's throne. You see, inside the ark is the Ten Commandments. It's the law. But what covers the ark is the blood. It's mercy. So God wants us to know he's fulfilled the law, that all the law has been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, that he sits on top of the law that is covered by mercy. So all the law that we couldn't live up to has been covered by the mercy and the grace of God. That is a powerful picture. Next, what God is showing us is that we have in this, in this ark is the golden pot of manna. Manna in the Old Testament was a bread-like substance that fed the Israelites for over 40 years as they wandered around in the wilderness. It only lasted, manna only lasted one day, and then they had to collect new manna off the ground. Uh, if they tried to keep it longer than a day, it was spoiled. It was rotten with worms. But the golden pot of manna that's found in this Ark of the Covenant never spoiled. That manna never dried up or became bad. It's a reminder that Jesus Christ is our manna. He is our bread of life. He is our provision that never runs dry, that never spoils, that from day, from one day to the next, he's always what we need. And then lastly, Aaron's rod, this is talked about later in scripture, was also placed eventually into the Ark of the Covenant. It was a stick, a stick, a rod, a staff that miraculously blossomed. And there's a whole story behind that. It's a cool thing to study. But this stick, you have to understand, is a, a dead thing. But it came alive. It blossomed. It was cut off from life. And yet this staff of Aaron's rod, it blossomed. It was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, who was raised up to die on the cross. But three days later, rose again with new life. He was dead, and yet he blossomed again with new life. See, each of these are a picture of the saving grace of Jesus Christ in our own lives. So let me ask you another question for the comments right now. Which one of these pictures resonate the most to you right now? Is it that mercy covers the law? Or how about that Christ is your everlasting provision in time of need? Or is it that you need new life to blossom out of the dead seasons of your life? that God can bring new life 
in the broken and dead areas of your life. Which one of these pictures really resonates to you most right now? Can, can you share that even in the comments? You see, I think all of these objects in the ark remind us that we can approach God boldly, right? That, that even if you feel like you can't, maybe if you feel like right now you can't feel like you're close to God, that you're, you're separated from God, that you're too bad or your past is too broken or messed up or screwed up, I want you to know that, that those thoughts are deception. You see, you can approach God's throne room, God's throne of mercy and grace boldly, because of specifically his mercy and his grace. Jesus Christ is offering to each one of us that free gift of grace, salvation, and mercy, his love. You don't deserve that grace on your best day. And you don't deserve his grace on your worst day. Okay, so here's another thing to write in the comments. Write guilty if uh, you've ever had this thought, okay? I want to ask you a question. Write guilty if you're like me and you've had this thought before. You've had this thought before. Man, if that one person would give their life to Jesus, they would be such a good Christian. They would be so saved. Oh man, they would just be the best. Uh, I'm guilty on that one. How about you? Write guilty if you are. Uh, I think that's pretty bad, right? It's pretty terrible. I think a lot of us are probably guilty of that. See, when a person thinks that a person would be so good if they just got saved, like they're so close already, what are we internally saying? What are we internally processing? What we're saying is we think that that person already seems to be a very good and moral person. And if they're good without Jesus, how much better would they be with Jesus? They are so moral already, it wouldn't be that hard for them to get saved, to get right with God. All right, now how about the opposite extreme? Let me ask you a question in the opposite extreme. Is there a person that you know, maybe they call themselves an atheist, maybe they're just so against religion and all that super spiritual stuff, however they label it, um, and, and it would blow your minds if they ever gave their life to Jesus Christ, if they ever became a Christian ever became a Jesus follower. All right, now write guilty in the comments if you can think of a person like that right now. That you're like, no way, they're, they're never gonna get their life right with God. That would just blow your mind. If you've ever had that thought, write guilty. See, I know we're all pretty terrible people for thinking both of those extreme thoughts. But here's what you need to understand and what I think a lot of times we don't understand. That it takes the same power for God to save that really moral person as it does to save the person who's really against God. It really does. And, and I think many people that are watching online right now, we found ourselves in both of those camps personally before God radically changed our life and gave us hope. Both extremes need the same amount of God's grace and mercy, uh, but both, uh, both extremes cannot approach God without Jesus. It doesn't matter how moral you are. It doesn't matter how wicked you are. Without Christ, we both don't have a chance to approach Christ. See, one person isn't easier for God to save. One isn't harder. And that's why scripture says in Isaiah 64, 6, it says we are all infected. It's like we've all got the virus, right? Well, what's the virus? The virus says we're all infected and impure with sin. When we display our righteous deeds, they're nothing more than Filthy rags. It's nothing more than filthy rags. See, on our best day, we are hopeless without Jesus. On our worst day, we are hopeless without Jesus. And can I tell you what? That's great news. That's actually really encouraging, despite how you might feel right now, because I, I can realize that I don't come to Jesus I don't come to God on my own merit or my own strength or my own good works, uh, that it's only through Jesus Christ that I have any hope of salvation. It's only through Jesus Christ that I can enter into his presence boldly. Trying to get there any other way through moral advancement or intellectual achievement, uh, maybe good deeds or religious actions just results in me and you trying to live out a different gospel 
instead of accepting Jesus Christ as our saving grace. And, and can I tell you what that other gospel is that so many of us, we reach towards? It's a gospel of pride, a, a gospel of self-importance. It's similar to the Old Testament story of the Tower of Babel. These guys tried to build a really tall tower to be like God, to reach God, and they tried to do it on their own strength without God's assistance. But we can't build a life that reaches God without God's help. The faith-filled and the faithless both need to understand that God's saving grace and God's mercy really does come as a free gift that we need to accept and hold on to even more tightly in times like this, during a pandemic where we feel broken, where we feel hopeless, where we feel distant and isolated. We need God's grace during this time more than ever before. Hebrews 4.16, let's go back to that verse. Let us then approach God's throne with grace and confidence. Not because of what we've done, not because we've earned it or worked our way there or because we've been crushing it as a parent in our home or we've been crushing it as a homeschool mom or dad or because we've been doing really awesome with our attitude right now and we haven't gotten too angry or because we've got the meals made or because we've done this social distancing thing so well. No, none of that makes us okay. It's because of what Christ has done so that we may receive mercy we, we approach his throne so we might be able to receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. This is our time of need. And if you have need, guess what? There's great hope because you can approach his throne boldly. No matter how you feel, no matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, this is your time to approach God's throne. And you can do it with confidence. Confidence. You know who approaches boldly? Kids approach boldly, right? Many parents in your house, maybe you've got a specific chair where dad or mom sit. And for me, I've got a place on my couch. Uh, it's kind of like dad's spot. It's my spot. And uh, it's the place I always sit. And, and my kids, my kids fight about sitting next to me. Yes, I am doing a little bit of a humble dad brag right now. Uh, I understand that. But I love it. I love when my two boys kind of fight about who gets to sit next to me and they kind of try to squirm and get close and they approach me very boldly. Why? Because they know that I'm a good father. They want to be around their dad. And when you have an understanding that you have a good father and that when you get around him, he just wants to love on you and he wants to give you grace and mercy in your time of need, dude, that's a game changer. Who wouldn't want to sit on dad's lap? Wait a second. Who wouldn't want to sit on the mercy seat. That's what you and I have an opportunity to do. There's an old song that says we can run to the mercy seat. You have a chance to run to the mercy seat, not because of who you are, not because of what you've done, but because of who he is. Here's why I'm spending so much time on this subject, so much time unpacking this truth today, because I think most of us only approach God based upon our feelings. Like, if you approach God, though, only on your feelings, most of the time you'll feel like you can never get close to God. And that's exactly what the enemy of your soul wants you to feel, that you're not good enough, you're not holy enough, you're not righteous enough, you're not, you're not clean enough, you're not prettied up enough to approach God, that you can jump into your father's lap. But the veil was ripped so that the mercy seat could be exposed, so that the seed on the Father's couch can be revealed, that you have access to God's presence right where you're at. Be like a kid again. Can I just encourage you to be like a kid to, today and, and run to mercy, run to grace, run to your Heavenly Father, no matter how you feel, because it's not based upon what you do, it's based upon who He is. Which reminds me of another question. For those of you that are living for God right now, and I understand that there might be some people that are watching it, and you're not, and that's totally cool. Thanks for being a part of today. But for those of you that are living for God really authentically right now, can you encourage maybe the rest of us uh, with what, what kind of 
What kind of God is he being to you right now? What kind of heavenly father is God revealing himself to you right now? Don't be super spiritual, but be honest. In a short phrase, why is God a good father to you? Maybe that's the better way of me phrasing this question. Why is God a good father to you? In a short phrase or a sentence, can you put that in the comments? I think it would encourage a lot of us to approach God boldly. Because when we start to see that God loves all of his kids and what he's doing in others, we can have the confidence to approach boldly too. How's God being good to you right now? Put that in the comments. God is full of grace and mercy. God is full of grace and mercy. But I think that opens up a new question. Josh, if God's full of grace and mercy, does that mean I can just live and do whatever I want? Just, I, I can just go on and do my own thing, live my life however I want? Well, the answer is actually no. But why not? Why not? Why not, Josh? If God's loving, if God's full of grace and mercy, why, and he, all, he forgives, then why not? Well, there's many reasons, but I want to focus on one. Last week, I described how this massive curtain, this veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom. And I told you how it allowed, uh, once that veil was ripped, it allowed God's presence to leave the building. It, that wall was broken that separated us from God. But the question has to be asked then, if, if God left the building, where did he go to? Where did he go? 1 Corinthians 3.16 actually gives us the answer. It says, do you not know <laughs> that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit now dwells in your midst? Wow, that's crazy. God's presence now rests in a new tabernacle and, and you are that tabernacle. Romans 8.11 expounds on it further. It says, and if Christ, or excuse me, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit who lives in you. We became the tabernacle. We became the dwelling place of the most high God. Jesus puts it this way in John 14, 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. And, and so this is why God challenges us not to live in sin. Are we going to mess up? Are we going to screw up at times? Absolutely. But, but choosing to live in sin, God says, no, 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 don't do this. Why? Because living in sin is continuing to do something that you know is wrong. That's what living in sin is. When I continue to do something that I know is wrong, that's living in sin. And, and when we sin, it's also often called grieving God's spirit, grieving the Holy Spirit. It's crazy to think that I can make God cry. But we have to understand that holiness can't dwell with wickedness. Holiness can't dwell with wickedness. How can pure water and muddied water maintain its properties and coexist? It can't. And, and I want you to remember that God wants to dwell with you, right? That's the whole point. God wants to dwell with you. So when we treat our living tabernacle, when we treat our lives, our bodies, like we are nothing, or when we treat sin like it is nothing, like it's not a big deal, I can just live my life and do whatever I want, we're essentially throwing trash in God's living room. When we live like that, when we live like this is our life and I can just live my life however I want to, we're actually desecrating holy property. This new tabernacle is us and God desires to dwell in you. God is saying, I want to put my spirit inside of you. I want a place where my spirit lives in each and every one of us. But all this trash, all this sin is cluttering things up. And I'm not going to dwell. I'm not going to rest in a place that stays a mess. When you feel uncomfortable about an action that you're taking, 
I know you've had moments like that. I know I sure have. Or maybe you feel a check in your heart, in your spirit, about something that you're watching online. Or maybe you feel like you need to apologize to someone because of what you just said. There's like this check in your heart. That's the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit living inside of you saying, son, daughter, why are you putting trash in my living room? Why are you making a mess? I, I, I'm trying to clean this place up. Can you deal with this? I'd like to help you. I'd like to give you grace and mercy in this situation, but you've got an action. You've got a role to play as well. Do any of you have a messy room in your house? Like if I were to come into your house, what would be that one place that you would not want the pastor to look? I mean, let's think about it really quick. All right, can you just share in the comments, where's the one place you would not want me to see? Is it your cabinet? Is it that one closet? Is it the bedroom, the storage drawer? What is the one place that's a complete mess? And how would you feel if I saw it? Can you just write that in the comments? What's that one place? You know, for me, it's, I have a closet next to our bathroom. I don't want anybody to see it. It's a hot mess. And I asked that question because we've all got one of those places. But how do you feel when you see the mess? You feel uneasy. You want to hide it. But another question, how do you feel when that mess gets cleaned up? You feel at peace. You feel at ease. See, I want you to know that that's what the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit disturbs us momentarily so that we can find peace eternally. That's what he wants to do in your heart and in your life. See, God is trying to clean up the living room. You are his living room. If your soul doesn't have peace right now, maybe you're watching this online and you know that your heart doesn't have peace with God, He's disturbing you because he wants to give you lasting peace. He wants, your, he wants his grace and mercy to help you clean things up. You see, the Holy Spirit is making you aware of things in his living room, in your life, uh, maybe that you aren't even aware of right now. Most of us in our homes, we have dimmer switches, right? You know those switches that we kind of bring up to dim up and down the light switches, and the Holy Spirit is much like a dimmer switch. Uh, what he does is he turns up the lights so that you can see things that you couldn't see before at a lower lighting level. You are now able to see that there's more trash in the living room than you thought. But we have to be in tune with the Holy Spirit for him to quote unquote turn up the lights. See, his illumination won't come with one simple flip of the switch, but rather, we have to be open to listening and hearing from him. And that's what makes the dimmer switch work. See, the light gradually comes on as we daily study and apply God's word to our lives. We, we make this word of God more alive and active, especially even seasons like this. You know, someone said something to me today that really impacted my heart. They said, you know what, Josh, you know what this whole virus thing is teaching me? how reliant I am upon other people for my relationship with God. And now I'm now alone with myself and I'm realizing what my relationship with God really looks like. Is it strong enough to stand on its own, just me and, me and Jesus? Maybe some of you are having a hard time with your relationship with God right now because truthfully it depended upon a lot of other people. There's right relationships that we all need but I think sometimes we have to remind, be reminded that we have to study God's word for ourselves, that we have to dig into him personally for ourselves. Remember what John 14, 15 says? We said it earlier. Jesus said, hey, if you love me, you obey my commandments. See, love drives obedience. Anything else, anything else will end up becoming dead religion or dry obligation. And who wants to live for God like that? As we obey God from a place of love, uh, that Holy Spirit dimmer light, if you will, gets brighter and brighter. It illuminates, illuminates what we need to deal with, with God's grace and with God's mercy in more and more incredible ways. See, as Christ followers, we do not act, we do not live like our life is our own. That's a crazy reality when you think about it, right? It's so contrary to what this world says, but we do we don't actually own our own bodies. 
Uh, what the gospel teaches is totally different. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20 says it like this, and it, and it makes it very practical and crazy personal, really in our space kind of personal. It says this. It starts with this. Flee sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are, what? Temples of the Holy Spirit. You're the new temple, the new tabernacle. Temples of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you? Whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Man, you can't make that more personal and maybe for some of us a little bit more awkward than that. Because our sexuality is so personal, isn't it? God addresses it. So we have to ask ourselves this hard question. How are you honoring God with your bodies right now? Or you could say it a different way. How are you honoring God with his tabernacle? Maybe that's another great comment for us to answer in the questions. If you dare, I mean, how can you honor God or how are you honoring God right now with your body in today's culture? How can we, in the culture we live in, honor God with our bodies? What do you guys think? Why don't you just share some thoughts in the comments? You see, God bought your life with his blood so that he could dwell with you, so that you could become his home. He wants you to become his living tabernacle because of what Christ did on the cross. And it's crazy. I mean, it's super crazy to think that God intended to make you into his holy of holies. Man, that, that thought just blows my mind because I know who I am. I know how screwed up, how messed up, how sinful I am. But God wants to make me into his holy of holies, the place where his presence dwells. Let me ask you another comment or another question for the comments. How does that make you feel? I mean, for real. How does that reality that God wants to make you into his holy of holies make you feel? Can you express those feelings in the comments right now? It might just be one word. God wants to make you into the holy of holies. It, it amazes me because when I think about it, here's what God's saying. God is saying that he wants to make us into his new ark of the covenant. He wants to make us into his new ark, the new carrier of his presence. Wow. How does God do that? Well, considering all of our failures and our shortcomings, he does that by pouring his Holy Spirit into us. It's the same thing we've been saying this entire time. He wants to pour his Holy Spirit into us. See, his name is the description of what he does. The Holy Spirit has come to make you and I Holy, holy. There's an old school term, it's called the fullness of the Spirit. It's kind of old school Pentecostal, I love it. The fullness of the Spirit. And what does that mean? It means that we're asking for the Holy Spirit to fill us up to overflowing. We're asking the Holy Spirit to crowd out all the sin, all the clutter, all the junk, all the baggage of our soul. Holy Spirit, would you overflow in us so that all the other stuff gets crowded out, gets thrown out of your living room. And so it's because I understand that I need Jesus. And it's because of my spiritual emptiness, my, my spiritual poverty, that it's, it's during pandemics and times like this every single day, no matter how good I'm feeling or how bad I'm feeling, I cry out, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill me. Pour out yourself to overflowing. God, would you pour out yourself in me, into this living tabernacle? Would you come and dwell inside of me? See, God doesn't want you to just have a moment with him. He wants you to be overflowing with him. He desires for his glory to fill your house to fill your life. And guess what? When a limitless God cannot fit in a limited you, 
What does that mean? It means that the God inside of you has to spill out. And as God overflows out of you, he flows onto a world around you that's in need of him. See, God wants to make you his living tabernacle so that as he overflows in you, it will spill out into all around you. And so here we are, here and now, each and every one of us saying, come, come Holy Spirit. God, would you pour yourself out? Would you dwell in this living tabernacle? Spirit, come. Spirit, come. of eternal promise stirring in your sons and daughters earth revealing heaven's wonders spirit come spirit come what you spoke is now unfolding Your children shall behold it. Dreams awaken in this moment. Spirit come, Spirit come. Pour it out. Let your love run over. Hear it now. Let your glory house pour it out let your love run over hear it now let your glory fill this house now the world awaits your presence and this power is within us we will rise to be your witness spirit come spirit come through you que tu amor desborde ahora Dios con tu gloria y Que tu amor desborde, ahora Dios, con tu gloria llenándonos. Tons of fire, testifying of the sun. Spirit, 
That song is an invitation. It's an invitation that God is waiting for you to invite him into your heart, into your life, into your tabernacle. Because God wants to clean us up. He wants to heal us. He wants to restore us. He wants to give us the grace and mercy and the love that we've been waiting for, that, we, that you have been longing for. If you're honest with yourself, you might be watching this right now and you know that you're distant from God. You know that your sin has separated you from God. But the great news is that God sits on his mercy seat and he's inviting you with mercy and grace to accept his forgiveness for your sins and a redemption back into the family of God. If you're watching right now and you would like that relationship with God, you'd like your sins to be forgiven and you'd like to have a fresh new start, today is your moment. All you have to do is say a simple prayer to God right here, right now. I'm gonna pray these words and I'd like for you to repeat them out loud, even in your house, your home, on your phone, wherever you're watching, say this prayer with me right now. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, come into my life. Jesus, you died on a cross and you rose again so that I could have a relationship with you. Forgive my sin. I repent of my mistakes. Make me pure. Make me holy. Would you fill me with your grace and mercy? You died on a cross and I believe you rose again so I can have new life with you. I accept your free gift of grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Wow, what an incredible thing you just did. The Word of God talks about how heaven is throwing a party right now. So I want you to know, I am slow clapping you right where you stand. I am awkwardly clapping by myself because I want you to know that a party is going on because you dedicated your life to Jesus Christ. Your sin is forgiven and Jesus wants to be your Lord and Savior. You're now a part of God's family. Can I encourage you to do two things? If you just prayed that prayer, you just start a relationship with Jesus Christ, can you text NEW to the number that you see on the screen right now? Do it right now. And if I had a phone, I would pull out my phone and I'd do it just to show, show you how, but could you just text NEW 
to that number because we like to journey alongside of you. I've got a couple free books. I'd love to send you some great resources so that you're not alone. So you've got some people that can walk alongside of you and help you on the greatest decision that you could have ever made. Just text new to that number right now. Or if you can't text, you can even say uh, new in the comments. Say new in the comments. And we'd like to reach out to you even on Facebook or social media. Also, I'm so excited about what God is doing in our church family. We've been learning to dwell with God. And so we'd love to connect with you as we close out this message today. We're about to have a family meetup on Zoom. I know some of us might be sick of Zoom, but I know we're not sick of each other. And so if you'd like to connect relationally, we'd love for you to join us right immediately after this service, right after I conclude on Zoom. Just check out the Zoom link in the description on social media. Thanks so much for being with us at Cross Church today. God is for you. God is with you. See you next week.